Hello, everybody. Welcome to Altium Academy. I'm your host, Zach Peterson. And today we're going to look at a very fun topic that was posted on my LinkedIn recently, and that is how to bridge grounds with ferrites, or rather how to screw up your PCB by bridging grounds with ferrites. Now, someone I follow on LinkedIn posted a question and an example circuit on this topic, and let's just say the responses to that were very colorful. We're gonna go over this because I think it's something that new designers are prone to do based on bad guidelines that are out there on the internet. Let's jump in and get started. Just recently, this question came across my LinkedIn. This question is from a boss, Jawadwala, and he posted a question about isolating two grounds in a power supply circuit. Let's take a look at that question. Is this the right way to isolate two grounds in a power supply circuit? If yes, then well and good. But if not, then what's the right way to isolate two grounds? Drop your answer in the comments. He also posted a circuit from an Altium schematic sheet. That circuit is here on screen. Now it's a little blurry because it has to be enlarged, but you can see what's going on here in this circuit. We basically have a voltage regulator. We're taking in 12 volts. We have some input capacitance. We step down the voltage to then power the enable line. And then we have our output voltage at five volts. We have some output capacitance, and then we have a feedback loop to regulate the voltage. Now, one thing you'll notice in this circuit is that we have two different ground nets, and those ground nets are linked together with a ferrite bead. And then the question asks about whether or not these two grounds are isolated. So this is a really interesting question because I constantly see it in bad PCB design guidelines. I think most designers are going to be inclined to use this method to link two grounds because it does eliminate the DC offset between those two grounds. And thus at DC, those two grounds are going to be at the same potential because at DC, the ferrite bead is basically an inductor. And of course, at zero frequency, an inductor has zero impedance. In this way, the ferrite bead is basically working like a net tie between the feedback line and the power ground pin. So if you look at the, it in this way, you're basically controlling what the return path is for any current on that feedback line. And then you are linking those two grounds back together on your output back to the primary ground on your input. So there are a couple of problems with this. First things first, if you just go onto Octopart and look up the part number and then take a look at the data sheet, you'll actually see that this circuit doesn't even follow the application guideline. Take a look at the application circuit here in the data sheet for this regulator. This application circuit doesn't even have separate grounds. All of the grounds are a continuous plane. Now you could use a net tie to isolate or partially separate all of the return currents on the output side from the input side if you want to, but frankly, a lot of times you really don't even need to do that. For the second point, let's take a look at this circuit again. In this circuit, we've only bridged the two grounds at DC, but we haven't bridged them at AC. So any AC noise on the secondary side of this regulator circuit is going to be more likely to radiate than it is to couple back to the primary side and then come back to the power return. So you basically created the situation where the primary side ground and that secondary side ground can oscillate with respect to each other and then you get a lot of noise emission. So this is terrible for EMI and EMC. This is yet again another instance where the best strategy for dealing with this regulator is just to use a big fat ground rail or a ground plane. Now, one of the most entertaining things about this post is not the guideline itself. And Abbas is a smart guy. I know that he knows better than to actually do this in the design. What's actually much more entertaining is all of the comments on this post. And all of the comments offer some really good design advice. So let's take a look at those comments. First, let's take a look at the core of this question. This question is asking about isolating grounds in a power supply. But of course, if you just go back to that data sheet, you will see that this particular component is not an isolating component. So what should you do instead? Well, let's take a look. Abiram SS Tiwari writes, if you want a proper isolation, then isolated power supplies are always the top option. We can isolate the ground using a capacitor to block any kind of DC. Abiram is right, you should just use an isolated power supply. There are some modules that will provide isolation, or you can build your own DC-DC converter, like a flyback converter. Take a look at the link in the video description to learn how to build that kind of isolated power supply. Ramin Gordy writes, 
I think the best way is to use an isolated DC to DC converter module, like in the other comments mentioned. Exactly, we have another expert stating, just use an isolated power supply topology, don't try to take a non-isolated component, and then try to separate grounds, and then link the grounds back together at DC, because you basically have no isolation at DC. Some of the other folks in the comments were questioning why you would even want to isolate this type of DC-DC converter in the first place. Kevin Salden writes, do you wish to separate small signal from power in the ground or to isolate the circuits? Rakesh Mehta writes, why do you want to isolate the grounds? Jorge Andres Estrada writes, your purpose is not clear. What about instead using an input filter that will help you reduce noise and reduce emissions? I second Rakesh Mehta's question, why do you want to isolate the grounds? This is the core question that you have to answer before you even try to implement an isolation scheme. Let's take a look at a couple other comments. Industry expert and EMC legend Kenneth Wyeth writes, first, explain to me the purpose of isolating ground returns. Great question. What is the purpose of doing this? It isn't even explained in the question, and it's not even explained in the context of the ferrite bead bridging grounds guideline. Costanti Matuzak writes, what do you mean by isolate? Surely not galvanic isolation. A ferrite in this location will affect high frequency current flow in the circuit, and it seems to rather be causing numerous issues rather than isolating anything. Maybe isolating a product from passing EMC tests. My guy Costanti is hitting it right on the head. This will prevent your product from passing an EMC test. The other thing that it does not do is provide any kind of galvanic isolation. It does not provide any DC galvanic isolation, and the galvanic isolation that it might provide at AC is going to be very low and essentially just be the breakdown of whatever that ferrite's withstand voltage is. I also added my own response to this thread. Let's take a quick look. This system has no isolation at DC. It has some kind of moderate isolation at some mid-range AC frequency, but not galvanic isolation up to the level we might prefer to see in some commercial equipment because the regulator is not isolated. So that's really the core point here. If you want to have isolated grounds, just use an isolated switching regulator that uses a transformer. The other big reason that you don't want to do this has to do with routing across that gap. In many instances where you have a power supply that is regulating from a high voltage to a low voltage, you may still need to access a component that uses that higher voltage, which then forces you to route something across that gap between those grounds. If you were trying to route a single-ended digital signal alongside that ferrite and thereby use the ferrite as part of the return path, you will have a high impedance return path and the signal will radiate. This is yet another reason not to use the ferrite to try and provide isolation because it's gonna create an EMC nightmare due to a bunch of radiation from signals that might pass over that gap between the return planes. Now I added a little bit to this with another response on this thread. Let's take a look. You asked about what is the right way to do it. The answer is also, it depends. There are some exceptions for EMC and power systems, such as large Y-type capacitors and isolated power supplies. This has all originated from a few corner cases that were taken way out of context and are applied in areas where they are not valid. I think this gets to the core of the guideline of using a ferrite to bridge grounds. It's something that works in some corner cases, but it gets taken way out of context and then applied in areas where it isn't applicable and ends up creating more problems than it solves. Pretty much everyone else that saw this guideline stated that this is a pretty bad thing to do and you should not implement this in your designs. Let's take a look at some comments. Ali Berga writes, sorry, but this power supply circuit explains how you can design the TPSM 86325 in a terrible way. Podcast guest Benjamin Dannon writes, using a ferrite in this manner does not isolate grounds. Those two grounds are basically shorted together. The frequency of the energy that moves across this ferrite will depend on the impedance of the ferrite. That is exactly what I was saying regarding the return path issue as well as the galvanic isolation issue. Juice Brillman writes, this is not the right way. VR1 doesn't provide any DC isolation. And if it would, FB1 doesn't either. From an EMI point of view, this is the worst thing you can do. 
Replace VR1 with an isolated SMPS. Replace FB1 with a capacitor to block DC while achieving low impedance for high frequencies. This gets back to the Y-type capacitor that I mentioned in my comment. The entire point of that capacitor is to block DC while allowing high frequency currents to then flow through back to the power input. This is a standard practice for EMI reduction in switching converters, and it is a preferred approach for ensuring galvanic isolation in an isolated power supply. Mark Wagner writes, I wouldn't recommend it as the regulator has only one ground pin. That means you will cause issues on the input during refresh or on the output during charging of the cap, depending on which ground is tied directly to the chip. Exactly right. Mark Wagner also hits it on the head and this goes back to what we see in the application circuit in the data sheet. Why would you add another ground when the data sheet is telling you that you only need one ground net for this circuit to work? Mark Wagner's comments are mirrored by Peter Hobin. He says, this is not good. The TI part has only one ground that you cannot split. If you want to remove EMC, use shielded inductors, common mode chokes, etc. But why isolate grounds at all? Usually, not always, it is best to have one large low impedance ground plane. Once again, the ground plane saves the day and solves most of the simplest EMI problems, including problems that are created by ferrites. I think the consensus is pretty clear. If you have two separate grounds that you're using for a power converter, don't bridge them back together with a ferrite. Instead, use an isolated switching regulator and bridge the grounds together with a Y-type capacitor. Make sure you size that capacitor so that its capacitance is larger than the capacitance across your transformer. If you do that, you will provide a path for high frequency currents rather than allowing them to radiate into free space and causing you to fail EMC. Thanks for tuning into this video, everybody. Make sure to hit that like button, hit that subscribe button, follow me on LinkedIn, follow Altium on LinkedIn, leave your comments and questions in the comment section. And of course, don't forget to call your fabricator, folks.